O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, and you certainly are our Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Back on New Year's Eve, everyone in my home was sick except for me. They spent most of the day and most of the night in bed, and it's New Year's Eve. I didn't know what to do, so I ran to Tops, and I got myself some pizzas, some Doritos, and a can of soup for my wife when she woke up. i got to take care of stuff like that. And I didn't necessarily want to, to bring in the new year by reading a book. And so I flipped through the channel, something I don't do very often. I began to flip through and I got all the way up to channel 131. I didn't even know there was a channel 131. And it was called the Smithsonian Channel. Anyone here ever accidentally land on the Smithsonian Channel at home? We got a four, maybe five of us. Some of us aren't very proud to say that we know where it is, but it's a cool channel. And, and on New Year's Eve, I was watching the Smithsonian Channel, and what came on was a marathon of the show Aerial America. Ariel America, uh, America is just an incredible episode. And in the first episode of, America, uh, of Ariel America I watched, it began to tell of the settlement in the history of Wyoming. I was instantly fascinated and found the scenery to be both breathtaking and awe-inspiring. I was so impressed with the natural beauty and wonder of Wyoming that I began to tell myself, in the future, when I have the chance, I am going to go to Wyoming. It looks like paradise. When my wife woke up the next morning, I informed her, and that was part of my bucket list, and I said, Carmen, I can't wait to one day to go to Wyoming. And she didn't have much of a response. But this morning, what comes to mind when you hear the word paradise? What sort of images does that word conjure up for you? Does the Garden of Eden ring a bell? Do images of gold streets and pearly gates dance in your head? When you hear the word paradise, are you immediately transported to a remote tropical island with white stunning beaches of sand and crystal clear water? Or are you on the slopes of a snow-covered mountain nestled in a lodge surrounded by evergreens? When you hear the word paradise, are you transported back to the old family farm where time stood still? Or are you whisked away in a New York minute to a world of skyscrapers and Uber drivers? What comes to your mind when you think of paradise? If we were to pose the same question to the Gospel of Luke, how might Luke respond? And on your behalf this past week, I have asked Luke, Luke, what comes to your mind when you hear the word paradise? And I figured that I already knew the answer. After all, I've been to seminary. 
I figured Luke might point us to the beauty of the Sea of Galilee, the backdrop to many of Jesus' teachings. Well, the rocky cliffs that sat on the outskirts of the wilderness where Jesus was tempted for 40 days. Or maybe even one of the quaint villages where Jesus restored people back to health. However, Luke surprises us, at least this week anyway, directing us to the killing fields next to the city dump in Jerusalem. And i got to be honest with you, when Luke shows us a picture, uh, we might, uh, shows us this picture, we might be inclined to mutter to ourselves, that's no paradise. But Luke insists that it is. Maybe Luke sees something that we can't. He sees a a, a sail that has captured the wind or marshmallows warmed over a campfire and the sound of children laughing together or two lovers serenaded by a violinist. Maybe Luke sees something we can over at the city dump. Over on that hill far away where there stood three crosses Two-thirds of the criminals that day were guilty, but all of them will be executed just the same. There we find Jesus with fellow criminals, one on his left and one on his right. And Luke tells us, one of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding Jesus saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. You know, up to this point, Luke has me totally lost. I, I'm still trying to figure out if, I, if I'm even looking on the right side of the map. Do I have it upside down or whatever? And what Luke describes, if we're honest to one with one another, sounds a whole lot more like one of our worst nightmares coming true than a paradise destination. And finding the location of paradise almost seems like a bad game of where's Waldo. I mean, we know Waldo is there somewhere in the picture. We just can't seem to find him yet. We are drawn into the drama of two criminals with their very different responses toward Jesus. One out and out rejects Jesus and the other with limited mobility at least tries to defend Jesus' honor. Luke has located Waldo for us. Luke knows exactly where we might discover paradise. Maybe this is why Luke says to us, look over here, over this way, near these verses down here. And so we look over there and we read, Then the criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Luke, with his eyes, directs us to keep reading. Go a little bit further now. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I suspect Luke places these words in the mouth of one of the criminals to suggest that Jesus' death on the cross will not be the end of Jesus' story. But I also believe that Luke has the criminal say these words to reinforce something that we may have overlooked earlier on in the gospel. Just a couple of chapters earlier, in the 17th chapter to be more precise, 
Luke says of Jesus, Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is among you. It's not necessarily a futuristic thing. The kingdom of God is already here. The kingdom of God is already present in the person of Jesus. And therefore, Jesus responds to the criminal's request. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Usually, the preacher at this point is emphasizing words like today and in paradise. The preacher might say, you know, today speaks of an immediacy. Something occurs right here, right now. No questions asked. No qualifying exams to pass. And then I suppose the preacher is supposed to tell us that the word paradise is not code for heaven. But a biblical allusion to the Garden of Eden long before we were banished from it. One theologian, Walter Brueggemann, tells us that the biblical understanding of paradise is linked to words like blessedness, fruitfulness, abundance, security, and well-being. All of which is offered by Jesus to the criminal on the cross today. But Luke has brought us out to the outskirts of Jerusalem with the stench of the burning trash and the sounds of crucifixion in the air, to properly remind us that paradise, contrary to public opinion, contrary to what our culture says, is not a destination on a map, but rightly understood to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hidden in plain sight between the words today and paradise. We are given the good news of the gospel. When Jesus says, you will be with me. You will be with me. Roland Williams once stated. To be with Jesus is to be claimed by Jesus. To be his friend is paradise. For Jesus is the kingdom of God. We need to know no more than this. To be in paradise is to be with Jesus. To be pulled into God's life by the love made visible on the cross. Every time I look at the scene that Luke brings us to this morning, I begin to speculate about the faith of the criminal. And if I linger there long enough, I begin to speculate about and ponder my own faith in Christ. Personally, I have found a great resource And a great source of comfort for me and wisdom in the words of the late Richard John Newhouse. And I pray that as I share these words with you this morning, that they will sustain you and me alike during this season of Lent, especially as we stay near the cross of Christ. Newhouse wrote, Jesus does not reject any who turn to him. At times we turn to him with little faith, at times with a mix of faith and doubt, when we are more sure of the doubt than of the faith. Jesus takes what we can get, so to speak, and gives immeasurably more than he receives. Jesus takes our faith more seriously than we do and makes of it more than we ever could. Newhouse continues, when our faith is weak, when we are assailed by contradictions and doubts, we are tempted to look at our faith 
to worry about our faith, to try to work more faith. And at such times, however, we must not look to our faith, but look to Him. Look to Him, listen to Him, and faith will take care of itself. It is my prayer that as we look upon our crucified Lord, we will hear Jesus reassuring us today that we will be with Him. With Him. Needless to say, this sounds way better than going to Wyoming. I offer this to you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said,